Hello and Namaste. Welcome to the first episode of Dialogue Diaries. Today marks the inception of our journey where you and me will travel through the lives of different accomplished professionals and try to learn from their lives and their perspective. The very first guest for our show is Mr. Rivaz Chetri, founder of Any Origins, someone who successfully created one of the fastest growing D2C brand in the country today. Being a hustling entrepreneur myself, this episode was really insightful for me. As we've spoken a lot about the entrepreneurship ecosystem, the tricks and trade of how to scale a business, and a lot more. But we shouldn't spoil the episode for you. So tune in till the end to soak in all the valuable content coming in your way. This is Sadan Sahu in conversation with Mr. Rivaz Chetri. Thank you. Do you do you feel that you know anyone can be an entrepreneur just a yes or no? No. No, but I think everyone should have entrepreneurial mindset. Anyone who is trying to be an entrepreneur or anyone who is trying to basically work on their idea, take that into market, it's not easy. The chances of failure is 99%. Whenever I think of an idea, I start creating a flow chart. Just don't work on that emotion, but let it settle. I like to call it a happy birthday syndrome. Everybody wishes you on your birthday and the next day everybody forgets about it. I've seen you represent Sikkim and your company in Dubai Expo as well. What do you think you did right? Like you know your company any origins as one of the fastest growing d2c company right now in india do you feel burden more than the experience i think is the connection it's a network that you go on building right today basically i can access to any social leaders across the world you have to nurture your friendship it's not always about business go to amazon look for dalit chili pickle and you'll find us or look people don't see opportunity in smaller things i had no liabilities in my life I still used to wake up at 4 work the entire day like everything starts very small Thank you so much Riyazda for giving us this time right for coming here and giving us your time to do this so uh how are you with all this hustle and bustle with elections coming in how are you how are you doing I think uh, I have mixed emotions uh, I really feel good that uh, I'm part of a process heading towards something but at the same time uh, to see things around uh which like doesn't digest at me very smoothly but uh, hoping that i can make some difference i are you are you liking the amount of pressure <laughs> like i can say because now like uh, like you know just to give context of you recently joined politics you are a very successful entrepreneur you know and uh, you are married you have your family and congratulations you have a baby now so uh is it difficult for you to balance all these aspects um to start with i think uh, politics in terms of politics uh, i think i was ne- never away from it because my father was a politician uh, okay. and uh, he gave up his life like i mean uh, as a politician uh, the entire life uh, that he lived uh, he lived as a politician and at the same time he was an entrepreneur so that gives me a lot of hope that i can manage this too uh and talking about family i think uh, they are my support system uh, my wife is a uh, great support on whatever i do uh, my daughter right now is my happiness um, like i can't wait to go back home and hold her every day uh, i think there is a big joy in that uh yeah other than that i think things are just rolling uh, one after another elections are coming very closer um and uh, maybe next 6 months uh, things will be very different but uh, but i'm trying to give my best uh, during this period so that tomorrow uh, like i don't regret that i didn't give my best in whatever i uh, jumped in for exactly so uh, like you mentioned that uh, so your father he was a politician and also an entrepreneur and uh, you know uh, he uh, passed away as a politician and an entrepreneur so like are you uh, that can i say like you know that's how you got the you know bug of entrepreneurship or how was it like uh, when you were young how did you get into you know entrepreneurship uh my father passed when i was i think around 6 or 7 years old um of the years that i've seen uh, him and his work and the stories i hear about him uh, he was a very fearless man uh, a man of dignity a man of honor 
I think that really inspired me to become an entrepreneur first because um, right from my college, uh, I started uh, I started venturing into different ideas. Uh, I think I tried more than 30, 35 different ideas. And that takes a lot of courage, right? Because uh, a lot of these ideas uh, really was not easy. Uh, like, I think starting something is much more easier. But if you have to shut down something, uh, <laughs> that's more difficult, right? Like, uh, uh, monetary is one thing. Uh, there are a lot of emotional attachment. At the same time, if it's infrastructure, uh, imagine if you're sh- shutting down uh, a laundry um, like you can't even fit all of those items in your house if, if you want to shut down right mm. and uh, to keep that alive every day you need to pay rent you need to pay people it's not easy mm. and uh, when I started like a lot of things like I mean the laundry was on loan right so there was that loan behind me um, but yeah I think uh, despite all of that even after I failed uh the laundromat venture, I still went on and I started many other ventures after that. And I think that comes with a lot of uh, courage, uh, a lot of resilience that uh, nothing's impossible. And if you see the recent times in COVID, um, I think that was one time uh, when I could uh, analyze, like basically introspect on whatever I have done as an entrepreneur and I think uh, COVID uh, taught me how to be resilient and uh, right now even if if even if any of my venture is failing um, I know that I'll overcome that right and I think COVID uh, was that time which taught me nothing is impossible uh, you can overcome any challenges that come like uh, in life right um, yeah I think that has really helped me shape uh, who I am today. So, uh, like, uh, you know, like you said, you've uh, done many ventures and we know that you have been involved in so many, like the laundry and, uh, you know, any taxi and uh, you had uh, uh, in in the field of music as well. So, uh, like, just one question to you. Do you feel that, you know, anyone can be an entrepreneur? Just a yes or no? So I have a follow-up question. No. Uh, I, I don't think everyone can be an entrepreneur, but I think everyone should have entrepreneurial mindset. Okay, the, I, that's a good point and we'll get back to that. But like you said, uh, no. So, you know, uh, sometimes uh, like um, if someone is like, you know, trying, trying a lot, you know, giving their everything and, uh, you know, putting in the hard work, putting in the time, money and everything. And, you know, things are not turning up like how it should. Right. So how do you, you know, assess that okay is this because i cannot do this or this is not what i should do or like you know like see you did a number of uh startups before finally coming down to any origins right and uh, many of them failed but you still kept on going and that is the reason why you have the experience and you are wise and you know at like today's point you are a very successful entrepreneur but it will not be the same for everyone so you know how would you you know assess that uh, I think entrepreneurship to me is a lifestyle. Uh, it's a capability, right? Uh, tomorrow, if I have to start something again, I know that uh, the chances of failure will be very less than what it was maybe 10 years back, right? But I think someone who is already trying, uh, somebody who is trying to make it happen, uh, they can definitely be an entrepreneur, right? Like that is the type of person uh, who becomes an entrepreneur. And I think one thing anyone who is trying to be an entrepreneur or anyone who is trying to uh, basically work on their idea and uh, take that into uh, market, I think one thing which I uh, definitely know is that it's not easy, right? Uh, Every entrepreneur or every aspiring entrepreneur should know that firstly, it's not easy, right? Uh, That there is the chances of failure is 99%, right? There's only 1% chance that uh, your idea will be successful. So if that is something which uh, which an aspiring entrepreneur knows, it's much easier that, okay, um, maybe this will not be successful, but I'll learn something out of it. Or uh, maybe, uh, basically, you should always think, on the ways uh, that is not working out, 
right and try to work uh, try to make that happen like for example um like basically a business or a startup to me is like a system okay right uh, basically whenever i think of an idea i start creating a flow chart okay. and uh, you should always keep a eye on uh, where it's going wrong if that can be fixed or not right uh, like for example uh, there's a idea that okay you you want to create a music app today okay. right the first thing is you create a app you launch it in the market right and then you tend to learn about how market responds right and if a market responds that okay uh, it's really good uh, just don't work on that emotion but let it settle right a lot of times uh, what i've seen is people get really excited with the initial uh, initial response to the idea uh, I, i like i like to call it a happy birthday syndrome right uh, that uh, everybody wishes you on your birthday and the next day everybody forgets forgets about it right uh, it shouldn't be that and maybe once it settles down uh, you'll get a real picture right for example uh, we worked on a music app in 2016 2017 uh, we launched the app uh, launching app was itself a big uh, thing then right uh, like we launched our app and Uh, that is when we realized uh, there is very few original music coming out um, maybe like uh, like even if you see today maybe there'll be uh, maybe 10 albums coming out uh, in a year or even less uh, independent quality, yeah, artists yeah, yeah independent artist or even less uh, yeah. uh, that will not help you sustain a music app mm-hmm. right uh that was one thing uh, maybe if i would have scaled that up to across northeast but again like even if you say across northeast the numbers are still uh not prominent right like to run a music app okay. right people will not uh want to listen to the same music but uh, if you see similarly there are many ideas uh, in terms of uh ott that has worked very regional otts yes. right uh maybe a music app uh, that can also Uh, leverage Le- i mean for example today like if you see every young person will be using spotify yeah. right uh, why not google music or why not youtube there will be few people who will use youtube music but they'll be for very specific purpose mm-hmm. right and to have a, a standalone music app just for a music of sikkim or um, nepali music or music from northeast uh, that that is a additional app which a person will not want to have mm. right so a lot of times i think that is how different ventures uh, don't scale up right uh, because their target customer or the area of operations are like are very small mm. compared to uh, bigger ones right so a lot of times uh, people in small town have great ideas but uh, again the capability to scale that up Uh, as compared to somebody living in bangalore or bombay it's much easier mm. right if you see uh, the kind of talent you get in Bam- uh, bangalore bombay the kind of funding you get in bangalore bombay so a lot of time a lot of ideas fail because of that so like uh, like you've mentioned right now that uh, you know mm, you don't have that kind of uh, talent say maybe talent or anything here in like you know smaller cities but uh, despite of that uh you are one of the founder who scaled your company to the national and international level right and uh, i've seen like you know i've followed you uh, much before like from the time when you had started any taxi right to be very honest from any taxi that's when i started following you and uh, i've seen you go to like you know represent sikkim and your company uh, in dubai expo as well so tell me like you know uh, how is that journey how when you look at retrospect you know when you look back what do you think you did right or what do you think you did wrong so that you reached at that point you know so that you know our viewers who 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 maybe you know wants to you know maybe have an idea wants to become an entrepreneur in future they can you know at least uh, get a certain amount of guidance so like you know these are the do's and don'ts a very basic one but at least like you know something mm, so i so i think that's a very uh that's one question which i ask myself every time because uh 
I have been like I mean there was a time uh, when I was uh, I had a startup called Sikkim Farms, right? We used to sell fresh uh, farm fresh chicken in Gangtok during COVID times. I think yes. a lot of people can yes. relate to it because we were the only source of protein then, yes. right? And uh, there was a time when uh, recruiting a person uh, during that time was very difficult. right uh, because you couldn't hire anyone because everyone was locked up in their house yeah right and uh, one of one of my manager in uh, one of my store got sick right and i had to take over that right and uh, during that time uh, when i was in the billing counter uh, like of a meat shop right and i was sitting down in the chair uh, it took me back to to a situation which uh, uh which you were pointing out it took me back to a, to 2019 uh when i was a guest speaker in vietnam okay. uh for forbes okay. right so it was a forbes 30 event of vietnam and i was there as a guest speaker because i was uh, on the list of forbes 30. under 13 asia in 2018 so they they called me as a guest speaker and uh, i was sitting in the chair right so it took me back and forth like i mean a uh, few years back i was sitting in that chair and few years after i was sitting in a chair of a meat shop right uh, i think one thing which uh, which which the experience which i wanted to uh, which i want to share here is uh, in life uh, nothing is permanent right uh, you you might be representing uh your state or your country to a platform which you are, which you can never imagine of uh and there can be situation which which can bring you down again right and i think to be an entrepreneur one capability every entrepreneur should have is is to switch back and forth right and uh, you can't always be that okay i am this person and this is not my job right uh, a lot of times you have to stand up uh, stand up beyond what you can imagine of right like today if you ask me to uh, like if i have to clean my office i'll clean my office right uh, if i have to cook i'll cook Because, like i know how to cook really well and uh, and i think that doesn't limit me right so like you mentioned dubai expo was one more experience right i went i represented my state country um and uh, basically pitched my idea to a global audience how was it how was the experience because you know uh, going and representing in uh, dubai expo which is a huge thing right and uh, you hailing from a uh, like a small state from northeast right and when 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 we did our research what we found is like there are hardly any companies which are even listed like you know your company any origins is listed as as one of the fastest growing d2c company right now in india so you know how do you take all that in and then you know uh, do you feel burdened honestly if you tell me do you feel burdened that you have a certain kind of responsibility um i think the only burden i feel is for my team right i feel i am responsible for all of them beyond that i really like i mean uh, it it it's one theory which uh, i personally believe that uh i really don't uh care a lot about what people say right so i'm not burdened at all uh, in terms of my social like i mean more than social my responsibility as an entrepreneur like i like i mean uh, if somebody has puts me into a category of successful entrepreneur and i have to be responsible for things uh, i don't consider myself responsible for that but but i think in terms of experience uh, representing in international platforms uh, one of the greatest or one of the best thing that i have received is network right uh, for example uh, i like i met uh, i have a friend in hong kong uh, his name is jeffrey yam uh, basically he's into investment right and in 20 i think 20 2020 he connected me to founder of rapido okay right and uh, jeffrey introduced that oh he is my friend uh, in northeast if you need any help in northeast connect to him yeah. right and when that level of connection gives you a, gives you a intro to a indian uh, popular brand right and then uh, you start being friends in that circle mm. right i think 
a lot of uh, like a lot of these conferences a lot of these events uh, more than the experience that uh, you get from them i think is the connection it's a network that you uh, go on building right today uh like i am part of acumen's uh, global network right it's called acumen foundry and i can ac- basically i can access to any uh, social leaders across the world right similarly i am part of forbes right i can access to any of the forbes uh, listed person across the globe like i can get connected like we have a app uh, which is very community specific and i can connect to anyone um across the world right so i i think a lot of times people think that uh, this like for example inc42 fast 42 is again another community right yeah, inc yeah. is also creating a community for entrepreneurs in india yeah. so from that community i know arjun vedya uh, who is right now like who is the founder of dr vedya uh, a ayurvedic startup and uh, right now uh, he is into a vc like basically invests in different startups uh, it's called v3 ventures right and uh, where we are connected on instagram and like we talk sometimes right and i think all of this event uh, all of this uh, different international expos meeting or any opportunity i get to represent my state um, i think my outcome will always be network so like if somebody gets an opportunity to go go out represent more than the experience i think you should talk to a lot of people there build right build connection and come back follow up right invite invite them to your place like i think a lot of things uh has happened because of that like for example uh, just in northeast right uh, you name any entrepreneur and uh, I- i'll have them in my contact, contact list or in your network right? so on a very lighter note so like you said right when you get to go to these places then you have you know the connection the network so like you know even we go out we have friends and there was a life that you had before becoming an entrepreneur so like you know on a very lighter note how different is that community and this community you know how different are your friends like you know what are what do they talk you know what do the like see we 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 are trying to build we are trying to get to a certain point right so just out of curiosity because uh, we are in a you know hustling phase which you have already passed and you have reached a certain level right so when you meet these entrepreneurs different entrepreneurs now they are your friends they are in your circle so when you meet what is the usual talk about like you know are you guys like do you talk normally or do, is it always about business or do you talk about sometimes you know some a little you know not so intense talks about just business or money or you know what is the next thing that you are doing or some entrepreneurial venture is it like you know a little chill with them as well um like i mean like if you see my friends in northeast right uh, a lot of them are older than uh, me right like in terms of age but i gel with them uh, like for example uh, one of my very close friend is bobby hanu uh, he's the founder of zero, zero festival, festival yes zero festival of music right and we were friends for 6 years and then uh, from last year uh, we are we are the official travel partner for zero right a lot of time uh, you have to nurture your friendship and it's not always about business right like it's just that uh, uh, bobby one day called me and asked me that uh, are you interested to be part of uh, zero festival of music right and i said why not right a lot of time you don't have to uh, actively pursue uh, business relation right business um like in this kind of communication comes out as a like i mean if tomorrow like it can happen but uh, usually like i mean usually it's not a lot of times of work like i i mean a lot of time it's more about uh, we talk about different places in northeast or bobby me we together uh, talked about how we can uh, basically create a ecosystem for entrepreneurs in northeast right we talk like we we basically talk about region or something like a topic which uh, we can all all connect right but but a lot of time we just go on a vacation have fun right i think uh, like in a year uh, bef- before now because i have joined politics uh, i haven't traveled outside of sikkim for a very long time but 
usually uh, i go on vacation with my friends maybe um like uh, me and bobby like we went to uh, this this place called uh, uh, like beyond zero there is this place called anini okay right and uh, uh, yeah and and a lot of times uh, like all of this connection uh, like it's just about exploring new places right like i got to explore zero because of bobby uh, i have a friend called meda putsure who is also a great entrepreneur in nagaland like he runs a chain of i think 14 15 uh, qsrs in nagaland called bambusa okay. right it's a uh, quick service restaurant uh, across dimapur Ko- kohima mokokchung right and a lot of time we just uh, whenever i go to nagaland uh, like i just go with him to uh, new places or whenever he comes to sikkim like we have made a trip to lache and lachung together right and we just talk about uh, like how life is and like just to live in the moment right like i think all friendships are very different uh, like i'm sure uh, like it's not the same for uh, all of my friends uh, i share different bonding Bonds with bobby with i share different bo- bonding with medo i have a friend in meghalaya whom i share different bond with i have a friend in assam whom, whom i share different bond with right but i think a lot of people whom i know are just entrepreneurs right so i think there is that common thing so entrepreneurship is like your common topic right it revolves around that only uh, like we don't talk a lot about entrepreneurship but i think uh an entrepreneur uh yeah like an an entrepreneur uh, have a different kind of mindset right like uh, so i think that is something that i enjoy but also if if i have to see my friends back in sikkim right uh they were a lot of my friends are again entrepreneurs here right sometimes i think for me i like to hang out with people who know more than me uh but a lot of times yeah like i have a, i my friends uh like whom i just do casual talk right on uh, what you are today one of my friend called me and asked me a recipe of chicken uh, uh chicken crisp which i made i think 6 or 7 years back i don't okay. even remember the recipe <laughs> okay right but uh, yeah like we do talk about random stuffs it's not always business so so like you you've mentioned just some time back also like you're a good cook so just not just cooking but uh, have you ever had any other hobbies or like something which you like you know sometime back in the day when you were young maybe thought that okay this could be my profession and then later on you you know finally came down to entrepreneurship i'm sure there must be something i don't think so that you know from the very first day you were like you know i want to be an entrepreneur so when i was in my school i wanted to become a sailor because i really sailor yeah so okay. i really thought it was cool uh well, why did you think it was cool i don't know like the uniform and yeah, all yeah maybe i think that is when i was uh, um when i was i think in class 8 9 uh then after uh, maybe after school i wanted to become security guard like i mean, yeah i mean yeah i mean the uh, i think it, like it's influenced by different movies not um like a very high professional uh maybe uh commando like like something of uh, that sort of security guard right and then later uh when i was about to uh pass out from my college uh while i was hustling uh, at one point i wanted to become uh like the advisor to a uh, different politician businessman right mm-hmm. uh those were my hobbies and then uh and then i once i uh, started giving full time in entrepreneurship right um, i think initially maybe for the first 3 or 4 years uh, when i was in my college and after that uh, i didn't know what entrepreneurship was or like from day one i uh, i didn't call myself an entrepreneur right entrepreneur is term so you know relevant at that point of time no no uh, right? no i don't think so it was relevant even when i launched my music app i think i didn't consider myself an entrepreneur i think businessman was something that was going on at that time entrepreneurship is something which is like you know a word with which people are connecting yeah a, a little later yeah right and in fact like uh, i know that you know you are one of the you know very responsible person for making it a household you know household word here at least here in uh, the state of sikkim and also in northeast so 
like you said okay so it's not just me having crazy dreams even you had you know back when i was in 7 or 8 uh, my mom just sent me few days back she sent me a photograph i had written a passage about how i want to become a golfer i mean so we all have had our share of those dreams but then like you know um do you remember your first venture like when did you think that okay no the, the like you did this and even though it failed maybe you thought that okay no this is something that i can do for the rest of my life do you remember um <laughs> when i was in my college i used to google uh, top 10 ideas in new york city i used to google top 10 ideas in london right basically i was just looking for new ideas to try but uh, i think before covid uh, there was a point uh, when i was just fully focused in any taxi i was scaling it i like i was one one venture person then right uh, i think there was a comfort which i had that okay now this is scaling i am like it's enough for me and i was just traveling the world right uh, there was one point of time uh, before covid when i used to travel for 6 months right i used to go to jaipur for diwali i used to uh, go to like like i i have traveled across the country before covid right and like i was just living my life right uh, i like i was making enough money i was just uh, that was like i mean i was just out of my hustling phase okay. right uh, when i had more money than like how much i could spend yeah, yeah. right uh, covid taught me about investment right before that it like all of my money was just lying in my savings account okay right uh, like i i didn't know that there there is something called stock market you can invest and all those things uh, but yeah like there was one point uh, when i felt that okay this is it right and uh, when covid happened uh, there was a there was a point where when i realized that can i start a new venture now like i was scared right like like it's yeah, scared because of covid i think your any taxi took a hit maybe uh, yeah Did like it? more yeah that was one part more than that because i was so comfortable with any taxi right i was scaling that up right and uh, there was a question on me uh, if i could so it's a very internal question uh, i used to think if i can again start something new and scale it up right because scaling a venture takes a lot of time Yes. right uh, making into a very sustainable uh, like it takes lot of time right like to create system you need to have sops your company should run smoothly uh, the inflow of uh, new customers needs to happen like how how do you scale that up right the, there has to be a system in place exactly uh, so that it, it scales rapidly uh, and uh, with any tech i was very comfortable right like i w- that is there was one point uh, when i felt that okay now i am a ceo <laughs> right otherwise okay. Uh, okay. ceo is just a title which every entrepreneur give to themselves yeah, but yeah. Uh, then you start feeling responsible you don't have any other work yeah. than to just manage your team your the, the growth of the company and uh, think of how you can basically scale it up to new places uh, there was one point when we were scaling to new cities like uh like in a day we used to scale to maybe 15 16 cities okay. because we knew what we were doing right and uh, from that point it was just rep- replicating the same thing in a new city so uh, there was a phase does it get easier to scale like say uh, say you started here in uh, gandok and then uh, now you you know certain things about how to run the business and you have a certain system that runs here in the city is it same when you scale it to like you know different uh, or different state when you go say if you are scaling it in assam or maybe meghalaya so is it same um, i think if the challenges are similar right if the problems are similar it's easier to uh, move from one city to another like for example any taxi is solving a problem of uh, of uh, transportation for uh, vacations right like suppose if you want to uh, travel to uh, shillong for a vacation yeah. right uh, we, like we are a perfect solution for that and if you just need transportation uh, so we are a holiday taxi company mm-hmm. so that was a problem across the country so we could scale that rapidly wherever we could right and we knew uh how to get new businesses in that particular city 
we, we knew that we had a SOP. We, we were 35 team, uh, 35 member team then, right? And for us, scaling was so easy. Like the entire company uh, employ the, the entire uh, structure of the team had their own SOPs. Like suppose if even if tomorrow I have to recruit a new salesperson, mm-hmm. uh, like it was so easy for them for us to train them because we had a written document we just used to hand that over so you had a certain system yeah so, so everything was in place right so um do you uh, like did any taxi take a hit because of uh ola uber and all these things uh, so like you said it's a holiday yeah. uh taxi cab and uh, it's a taxi service so like you know now nowadays it's very easy to uh, yeah. book a ola uber yeah. and now you know with blue smart and yeah. all these things in other bigger cities so do you think, uh, you know, that's the reason why it took a hit or something? No. Uh, so you can't book an Ola for five days uh, for a particular, like, I mean, suppose if you want to travel to uh, North India, right, you can't book a Ola on a go for five days, okay. right? So we, we are a solution which provides that. Like, for example, if you want to travel to Sikkim, Darjeeling, uh, you go to to our website, go put in your query, you get all the... Uh, like basically for the entire five days six days stretch you get the rate all at once you mm-hmm. book it mm-hmm. right and then you are done there's no hidden cost beyond hidden cost. whatever it's written there what? okay. right if, if, like if there's any inclusion exclusion everything is disclosed there and beyond that uh, we don't charge anything extra right so for a lot of people uh, that is how people travel right uh, the entire travel industry works on that because people don't know uh, directions to this place people don't know where to go how to do so we help them with all of those things so it was a solution designed uh, for vacations so ola and uber are intercity or uh, basically from one point to another. another point right so that really helped us okay uh, so that's how you guys were different but you know like uh, like we just discussed like you know how you had a laundry service initially before the covid and you know during covid it took a hit uh, you've done some work in the music industry and uh, taxi service and now it's any origins which scaled exponentially but you know uh, like what we can see here is like you know all of these uh, uh, different businesses that you've built these are like in different sectors but these are all consumer centric brands right so um, is it something that you did consciously or like you know uh, did it just happen or are you like you know just uh, or is it just because you like to you know look at a problem and then try to solve it and then that's the reason why you do it so how did you like you know choose d to c to be your you know thing um i think a lot of the solution which i create is uh, like like these are the problems which i personally felt myself right like i mean uh, when like how any taxi started was because I took a hotel uh, on a management contract in Bomdila uh, in Arunachal Pradesh and a lot of people were inquiring taxis uh, to hotel owners, right? And that is one opportunity which I felt that, okay, I can jump in. And that that uh, that was how any taxi was created. Um, any origins on the other side, uh, COVID hit us, right? And uh, a lot of... Uh, a lot of sellers from across northeast were my friends right they were they had different brands different products and uh, while i was uh, uh, speaking to them uh, they mentioned that uh, like it's difficult for them to sell now so we created a marketplace initially right any origins was a marketplace where there were more than thousands of different products from more than 400 or uh, 450 different uh, small and micro businesses across northeast right so we created a marketplace and then what we realized was uh, more than marketplace there's no trust uh, towards uh, product from northeast right i mean uh, there was no quality control like for example we were selling five different varieties of king chili pickle one of the king chili pickle was really good but people while uh, they were browsing internet they, they were trying out all of the different varieties right and uh, some king chili uh, pickle didn't have the quality standard uh, which our consumer would want, right? And like we as a marketplace couldn't control that, right? Uh, in terms of quality control because marketplace, like we were just uh, fulfilling uh, right from the manufacturer to a customer directly. So that was an opportunity then. Uh, then we realized uh, why don't we uh, ourselves become a brand, right? And start aggregating best uh, best of the northeastern products and take it to 
uh, market across the country and the world. Uh, so then we picked uh, the best selling products from our own platform, uh, went into contract with different manufacturers uh, because we still want to support small businesses, right? And uh, that is how it started. And right now we are in Amazon, we are in Flipkart, we are selling all of this indigenous food, mm. right? You can just go to Amazon, look for Dalit Chili Pickle and you'll find us or look look for Gundruk and you'll find us, yeah. right? So we are still focused on the core, right? We want to take notice to the world, right? And uh, I think uh, any taxi on the other hand, which is still operational, uh, brings world to the Northeast, so... Oh, so you, you are a two-way connection to yeah, the Northeast. Yeah, so we are a two-way connection to the Northeast. <laughs> yeah, that's a really, you know, that's been put really nicely by you. So was this tagline consciously put in or like just, okay. So, uh, you know, um, let's, you know, get down to uh, the any origins business. You know, I think if we break that down a little bit, it'll be more helpful for the uh, viewers as well to learn as to how to, you know, um, scale up a business or, you know, how to start. So, you know, uh like you just talked about Gundro, Kinima, right? And uh, King Chili Pickle. Now, these are some things which is like, you know, very uh, close to us since we hail from the Northeast, right? So, like initially when you thought of starting this, like, you know, starting a marketplace where you get to sell these things. Now, see, this is an idea which you can, like, if you go down and you look at a market, you get this there as well, right? For people who are here, you get this there, there as well. But... There's always a story behind every, like, you know, great company and like, your company is doing very well right now. So what is that story? How did you think that, okay, I'll take this simple idea and, you know, turn it into a brand and scale it to this place where, like, you know, everyone is aware of what Gundruk is now or at least even if you're, they're not aware, they can always type C and they'll find you, right? So how did you build this up in your head before you actually started it? Like, how did it come? I think uh, one thing which uh, like which I which I know about like for example Kinema uh, it's called Akhoni Nagland yeah right it's called um, Hawaii Jar in uh, Manipur yeah right it's called Thurumbai in Meghalaya, in Meghalaya yeah uh, and uh, just recently I was in World Food India in Delhi um, it's called Tempe uh, in Europe like I, I think like uh, fermented soya bean it's called natto in japan okay right and uh, i tasted a tempeh block uh, in a netherlands stall okay right and uh, in ne- and that's kinema yeah yeah it's fermented soya bean okay right <laughs> and uh, basically they have made into a block okay and how they market it is uh, it's very rich in protein right and it's vegetarian right and uh, one of my friend from gujarat is ex- actually exporting one of the best quality soya bean from here to europe and it gets fermented in europe okay. right and uh, they have created a process uh, how, like how they manufacture tempeh now right and uh, tempeh is like superfood uh, in terms of like the, the name of the company which I tried from was I think Tempe today like uh, yeah you can just check it out later and uh, they're selling Kinema right okay. and I was shocked and and uh, and out here like how I am shocked right now yeah and, and out here we are so shy to basically uh, yeah say that it's Kinema yeah, because it, yeah I get what you're saying yeah. and uh, and I and I have tried uh, like any origins right now has a product called kinema seasoning okay right and if uh, i remove the label nobody will even think that it's kinema okay uh, because it's uh, the taste is uh, very different and it's very appetizing okay right uh, what about the fragrance fragrance is there but still the same yeah it, like it's mi- minimized but it's still the same but uh, that is one of the product which we have which we have recent, uh, recently launched but my point is, Kinema today is not... Like, we, do, we are not so proud of our own product. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Uh, and people across the world are basically right now creating businesses out of it. I haven't seen anyone from Sikkim. Uh, like, because we are we are a brand. Uh, like, we are selling product from across Northeast, right? But yeah. why not a Sikkimese person or uh, anyone from the hills who knows kinema really well 
uh, works on it and creates maybe a kinema cracker or something right like uh, like it sounds more fancy and uh, people consumes it right and there's that pride and we know our, we know our product right like, yeah. like 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 for example i think every household in uh, in sikkim darjeeling will know how to make kinema yeah and in different variations with right. pork with yeah. chutney yeah. Yeah. or anything as sabji yeah. yeah but why not make it into a snacks right like why is there no innovation in food like i mean if you see the kind of innovation uh, uh we have in food in sikkim or uh, darjeeling or the northeast like it's very less right and i think there's lot of opportunity in that uh, for example gundruk like how like if i have to pitch a gundruk to a person who are not from the hills okay right gundruk is a uh, fermented dried mustard leaf okay. right uh, which is good for your gut health right and people just take it right because right now and and, and if you say it's prebiotic right it's good for your gut health people have that different perception towards it yeah that healthy perception right but uh, like if you see right now we are not working on our own indigenous product like there are so many products like which are not even found in the market right now uh, for example uh like bakimlo yeah you know bakimlo yeah yeah uh like in villages they used to make chuk right uh, bakimlo ko chuk and uh the bakimlo is called sumak in english right like it's very popular in uh, middle east or uh, there's a company called diaspora uh, and they sell sumak powder uh, a small maybe 30 grams for mo- like uh, maybe 10 dollars or something so is this the reason why you know you thought that there's an opportunity no i, I went uh, basically i entered the door right and then i realized oh and that there's a right? huge opportunity there's, okay like there's such a big opportunity in food mm-hmm. right and we are not even looking at it okay so it's the other way around yeah right uh, because before that like i like uh, I, i didn't know how big the market was how big the opportunity is right like for example uh, we are today i think uh, the biggest uh, dalle brand uh, that sells online right and uh, we started one year back exactly right and people don't see opportunity in this smaller things right like pe- pe- people don't want to uh, take indigenous products outside but uh, like if you see there's an entire category of gourmet market mm. right looking for northeastern products uh, like for example we we shelve our product in bombay gourmet market they they have around uh, 13 14 locations across bombay right and uh, there was a space uh, for northeastern gourmet products right and there is an enough gourmet product from northeast so i think there is a huge opportunity on what uh, product from northeast can achieve because uh, people from across the country are traveling to northeast they are liking the palate yeah. right uh, people love uh, northeastern product like if you see after uh, after momo and chowmin right uh, another big category uh, that is coming up is naga food yeah, people yeah. across the country love naga food yeah. and you find naga restaurants in almost every big state as well yeah and uh, if you go to zomato swiggy naga food is right now a category yeah. uh, if you like like for example today if you want to make a butter chicken yeah. there is a ready made spice yeah right uh, you can just have a ready to cook spice yeah, of cook spice. Uh, butter chicken yeah. right you just need to put chicken and put that masala and your uh, butter, butter chicken, chicken is ready, ready. yeah uh, do you think we have that for naga pork no but that's a very interesting way to look at it you actually like you know it's a very interesting thing that you're saying we actually don't have anything like that in the you know northeastern food like uh, so uh, my roots are also like you know very spread out uh, like my my dad's dad is from gadwal my dad's mom is from shillong she is a nepali my mom was born and brought up in manipur but she is a nepali my uh, mom's father is nepali guru but like you know so uh, we love manipuri food and that irumba and um, uh, say natoiba and all these things right but 
like you said there's no ready made this thing there i'm sure uh, do you, don't you think but it is because of the way they cook it like you know because um, like household wise also when i go home or like when they cook irumba like when they make irumba so they say till the time they don't make it with their own hand you know the flavor is not like that so do you think that it is possible to make those ready made mixes for like you know products here in uh, the northeast like i'm sure see like butter cook uh, butter chicken butter chicken cooked at home will obviously taste superior than a ready to eat mm-hmm. but uh, we don't have an option yeah, yeah. right for example today you are in indore right where there is no naga restaurant but uh, you have always lived in bangalore where you love naga food and right now you are in indore and there is no naga restaurant right mm-hmm. to have a substitute like this really works really well and not every time you have to order online mm-hmm. right you can just swap, you just want to refrigerate something and uh, just bring in meat and just put that spice and uh, get the meal ready right we are that generation yeah. right a lot of times we are in very tight budget and ordering online sometimes is very expensive yeah right so i think there is lot of opportunity if we look that way right uh, like for example uh sikkim today like a lot of the products that we have are uh, not even like we don't even have primary processing startups here right uh, today we are still s- selling kodo paper just in a raw form yeah, yeah right yeah. there's nothing beyond that yeah yeah there's right? no proper brand selling it like um yeah right. so that is one one thing but we don't have a kodo cracker or uh, today we don't have a like for example uh paper uh cake or something mm-hmm. right like uh, like paper to, chips maybe yeah right and we are not working on anything right uh, we we, have, we just love to enjoy maybe tapioca chips from outside right but we have so many uh products which can be made into chips uh like like if you see right now we are in season of oranges yeah. right i think there is no other company other than sikkim supreme in sikkim right who who is uh, using uh, any of the fru- fruit that we have in the state into anything else other than that right for example orange oil like like if you take one drop of orange oil okay right there is enough vitamin c for the entire day okay right uh, so do you get it is it processed somewhere yeah i mean you can always get it but uh, somebody needs to do it right like 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 for example today uh we are not doing anything in terms of food in terms of innovation in sikkim right and we still say that there's there's no opportunity uh um, living here is it happening in northeast at least uh not in terms of orange oil but or anything in like you know food related innovation yeah. Yeah. happening in northeast yeah i think like if you see a uh, northeastern region uh is uh, like like in terms of tea we yeah. we, we are the hotspot for tea. uh 40 across the world right like i think uh, assam and uh, like assam, you see west bengal uh, combined uh, might have more than 60 to 70% of market share yeah. right what is the innovation we have in tea zero right uh, if you see coffee uh, right now from instant uh, they have flavored coffee it, there's so much of innovation and right now all of the youngsters are just jumping that coffee wagon mm-hmm. right Uh, but if you see in terms of tea uh, we are still i think we are just limited to premix the tea may you have a green tea huh? L- ginger lemon honey tea and these things are there yeah, it's just flavor but yeah, the flavors are there yeah i think uh, nothing beyond it yeah nothing beyond it one of my friend uh, from assam uh, he has uh, without the tea bag yeah Yeah. Ula. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just I I had also come across that. Yeah, Up, uh, his friend his name is Upmanyu. He is yeah. from Sip Sagar. Yes. Like we are yes. good friends. Yes. And uh, we always talk about the challenges of entrepreneurship in Northeast and uh, like he is working on a great I was looking at that uh, you know that venture as well because I was very much interested to you know meet with him also some day. It's something interesting that he was doing. He uh, it's without the tea bag, right? Yeah. So so what is he using like since he's your friend just... Yeah so so basically what they do is uh the entire long leaf tea okay. right uh he has a technology which squeezes that in okay and dries it right and uh like and it's tied with a string string yeah. right and if you put it in a warm uh warm water it just blooms 
Oh, okay. So it's not bloomed from before. No. Oh, so it's a okay, very okay. small uh, compressed tea. Okay. And whenever you put it in the water, it just blooms. So I think, uh, like, like if you have a see-through cup, mm. uh, you see the entire blooming oh, okay, okay. phase of the tea. That's something interesting. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, coming back to any origins. So. Uh, so like you said it's like you know you entered the door and then you saw that there's you know a lot of opportunities there but still you know it takes a lot for any company to scale to the level that you have scaled it's not uh, you're a very this company is very young even though you know entrepreneurship is not like you know uh, it's not new to you but the company is new to you right you, this is something that you were doing it for the first time so what are like you know few of the KPIs that you you know strictly followed in order to scale the business to the level that you've taken because right now i know that you are, you are one of the only people who are representing in this field right you're representing northeast to the world to india and then uh, you've taken it to a different level international level right so how did you scale it what are those kpis like if you had to number it say 1 to 5 maybe or whatever you feel like right what are those kpis that you followed to in order to scale See, I think uh, from day one, if you want to scale, uh, you'll have to bring that discipline, right? Like, because we are a consumer-facing brand, I think uh, if you see any origins, any of our products, it's standardized, right? I think you can't scale without standardizing your product, okay. right? Uh, for example, tomorrow, if we have to create a new product, we have our SOPs, we have a set system. Right. And uh, suppose for us to take one uh, product from uh, an idea to market, uh, basically we have a 15 days turnaround cycle. Okay. Right. So, so the first, I think, KPI for us was standardization. Right. Uh, and uh, we don't like, for example, every product of any origins, which will, will look very similar. Right. Because yep. uh, like we follow very uh, strict uh brand guidelines right so secondly every product that we pick uh, like out of 10 product maybe five product will work five product will not work right but every product we pick uh, we try to make sure that it has enough market right sometimes uh, we tend to pick product which which uh, doesn't have market at all right uh, so like how do we analyze whether a product has market or not is not uh, like for example we started selling gundruk right uh, and there was nobody selling gundruk online okay right so but people knew what gundruk was so that like that is how we identify whether a consumer know, knows about a product and it's not available online okay. right so we entered that category uh, so so we always do a good uh, market research right before we get into any product uh, third thing is uh, I think one thing that you should uh, once once you have a consumer brand your unit economics has to be very clear yeah right uh, which means that uh, every product that we sell uh, we try to be uh, product level profitable uh, right from day one right like we don't sell product uh, like which costs you a lot uh, we, which cost us a lot at the same time uh, like which doesn't uh, basically right from uh, product pricing to uh, to basically like a lot of time we do a lot of bulk uh, orders also right we make sure that our pricing our uh, our procurement cost everything uh, fits the market standard so that we don't make a loss in the long term right uh, so, so unit economics is very important. Another thing is we don't work on product which uh, which is not in abundance, uh, like in terms of raw material. Okay. Right. Like we don't like we don't pick a product until unless we know that we can basically uh, sell online or supply to our partners throughout the year. Right. A lot of times, what we do is we pick products which uh, which are which are not available around the year. Right. And suppose, suppose if you have ordered a Dalai Chili Pickle from us uh, today and you loved it, right. And uh, you want to reorder in next three months and you go online and you don't find us again. Right. That's a big disappointment. Yeah. So make sure we, we always make sure that any product that we pick, uh, we should be able to supply it from the, otherwise we don't pick a product. Right. Uh, sometimes product are so niche, uh, like 
some products are so good but at the same time uh, if you can't supply it around the year so that's a big disappointment right and uh, i think uh, first was standardization uh, second was market, market research. research third is unit economics unit economics fourth is your uh, raw material supply raw material supply and i think the fi- the fifth and the most important that for any origins we do is uh some way other the product has to be connected to northeast sentiment okay right uh, so keeping it indigenous yeah so that is one one of the most important thing for us because we don't want to start selling a product uh, which which a person from northeast or uh, a person from outside can't relate to with northeast right like even though if it yes uh, sells so well right yeah, I get it. like for example we will not get uh, into product uh like uh, like we will not get into product which we don't manufacture in northeast or uh, which we can't relate uh, exactly. to this region so these are uh, five of the key aspects that uh, we check so will it be fair if i say your fifth kpi for your company is the emotional sentiment connected to it uh yeah i think for us uh, from the time we started any origins right the from the name itself yeah. right it's northeast origins yes. right so and your tagline is also like you know taking northeast to the world yeah right. and uh, the official tagline is truly indigenous yeah right so we don't go beyond that mm-hmm. right and i think keeping uh, for us to be intact in that particular sentiment at least uh, today the market might be small mm-hmm. but as we scale if people can relate uh like if uh, somebody goes online and wants to buy a product from northeast and if they can think about us i think uh, we are set okay so uh, you know uh, post covid you know the market size has really increased a lot right uh, so like according to the facts like you know you uh, it was 180 to 190 million post yeah. covid around 2021 and 40 to 50 million in 2021 itself after covid and now the trend right now the trend is like you know uh people from the northeast and two tier three tier cities also they are buying a lot of products online right which was not there before so is it did you take this as a like you know as a sign that okay i can do something in the you know online segment and uh, that was also like maybe one of the reason why you got into the online market you know place um i think one of the forte which like me as an entrepreneur i think one of the advantage i have is i've always built online brands right like i mean a lot of the brands that i have built like even for laundry like we had a website we had everything in place right uh, for right from day one i think one of the biggest advantage like i am not a techie right but i know how to build a website right and uh, to have that capability for me it has helped me right so that i am not so much dependent uh, outside of myself mm-hmm. right and uh, when whenever you worked uh whenever you work on your ideas initially mm-hmm. uh you try to do things that you know first right so building a website was always that first thing i did so that's why i think online marketplaces so uh, like you know uh, right now after like you know with all these new uh, startups coming up india right now is home to almost about 800 to 850 startups going on and the startup ecosystem in india is really booming right but we like when i was doing my research and all that i still found that there are not many of the startups coming from the northeast region right or at least even if they are they are not coming to that level where it's being like you know so, uh, acclaimed nationally or maybe internationally so like i said you're one of the very few that are there so what would you say you know what is holding the northeast ecosystem back or is is there some like what is the reason behind you know us not being there as of now i think it's practical challenges right like it's not that northeastern people or, or the northeastern entrepreneurs don't have that capability yeah, yeah. that's <laughs> right yeah. i know great founders in northeast uh, who are struggling to raise money okay. right uh, like for example uh, if you are based out of bombay or bangalore uh, access to funds are much easier right then to an entrepreneur who is based out of gantok or Darjeeling or uh, Kohima or Aizol, right? So I think uh, the access to fund is one big uh, reason. Uh, other than that, if you see, there's no ecosystem, right? Like for example, 
uh, if you are in Bangalore, if you want to start something, you can just pack your bag, go to a WeWork. You'll find so many or go to any co-working space. You'll find so many like-minded entrepreneurs, right? But when you come to smaller cities, uh, you, you you basically don't find that circle, right? You struggle to find that circle. I think that is one big challenge. Uh, there is no ecosystem in place. Uh, there is no accepted like like if you see, uh, if you go to Bombay, and if you say that uh, I am working on a music app, and this is how I am going to change the world, right? The acceptance to your idea is much more, right? Uh, and uh, compared to starting a music app in Siliguri or Kohima, right? Uh, people are hustling in their own ways, but uh, also I think one of the biggest disadvantage northeastern cities have is population, right? Like uh, like today, right now we're in Gangtok, right? Gangtok city has maybe like if you count everything, maybe we have one point five two lakh population, right? Uh, and if you go to Delhi, right, uh, a small block will have. Uh, more number of people than the whole town, mm. right? Sikkim all together might might have eight, seven eight lakh people living here, mm. right? And if you go uh, to a village in uh, UP or Bihar or any other cities across the country, we'll have more population. So I think we live in that disadvantage, right? Uh, at the same time, uh, because uh, uh, the culture uh, of the like basically uh, we are like we are not in rush right uh, i mean uh, like in sikkim bistari why also we, yeah. we, we like we still live in that culture like yeah. assam also has uh, i think i forgot the term it's ahoy lahe, ahoy lahe lahe right aste aste so i mean like if you see uh, we are still in that culture where uh, things like it's not disadvantage uh, like like I mean uh, living a life that way like we are much happier right uh, like like uh, less of hustle bustle here like it's less of hustle bustle uh, we are fine uh, like you, like even if we sleep the entire day like we don't have that problem right like we like we, we live in a very calm peaceful culture mm-hmm. right uh, compared to cities uh, like you don't do that like suppose even if I go to Delhi uh, I can just stay in my room the entire day mm-hmm. right I have to go out do something right and uh, then you start meeting people who are doing uh, basically working from right from morning till the night right and still doing a night job again or maybe studying in the night so people are hustling more mm-hmm. right but we uh, like like we come from a culture where uh, like I like I wouldn't say laid back, but we we are slow, peaceful, right? Like we like we we love to stay in our own peace, right? So I think uh, that is one reason why, uh, like for example, when I started uh, my office in Gangtok, right? It was very difficult for me to convince pe- convince all my team member to work from nine to five. <laughs> right yeah uh, like it was very difficult because the entire I understand that the entire office culture is 10 30 to 4 yeah, yeah, yeah. right and uh, you have one hour lunch break so when will you work yeah. right and uh, and at the same time we are compete because with the internet we are competing with people across the world exactly right somebody living in uh, bangalore bombay they come to office at 8 and leave at 6 in the evening that is also not for sure right uh, or maybe eight to eight, maybe like they, they work twelve hours and like we are working six hours. So uh, there is that disadvantage. So like, can it be because you know, or like, uh, like I just uh, you know realize this in all these big cities, there's something called the corporate culture, which makes them hustle like anything more than like you know, um, no matter whatever they are paid, they are like you know continuously into their zone and they are working and working. Do you feel that? It's also because of that that they are more driven and, you know, they are more like, you know, they are into like getting things done and uh, then they start having ideas. Now, see, uh, here we still spend a lot of time with our family outside in big cities. You don't get to spend so much time with your family. I think the most amount of time you spend is with your colleagues and with people who are like, you know, around you. So 
and uh, what i have noticed is there's not a lot of corporate culture in the northeast right uh, so can you like is that maybe a, one of the reason why you know ecosystem is not coming up that way uh, i mean see uh, one thing is that uh, that might be one case right but even if you see right now the startup culture across the country talks a lot about work life balance right uh, and if you see in that perspective uh, sikkim has a very good work life balance <laughs> but i <I've, right? laughs> but i've never seen an entrepreneur having a work life balance and then scaling up to that level i'm sure even you don't have because when i call you that time also you were busy yeah right so i don't think so <laughs> that work life balance is something yeah. i think it's something ideal uh, so so see like one thing is that entrepreneurs right uh, like i can close my eyes i i can go back to my college dorm room right and i had no liabilities in my life mm. uh, i still used to wake up at 4 and uh, work the entire day right working on my idea working on different ideas right and still not even making a penny out of it mm. right the first uh, e-commerce company i launched uh, in my college right and i knew uh, so when i so the name of the company was sikkim s w e k i m right s w e k i m yeah and uh, sikkim.com and if you you can go to uh right now uh, with the technology you can go back and see that website back in 17 18 i used to sell sikkim supreme squash i used to sell sikkim supreme pickle okay but i never sold even a piece right okay. and i exactly knew why it didn't work work for me then right uh, there was a very f- specific reason so it's a journey from sikkim as wkim to any origin yeah, i guess yeah and and uh, during covid Uh, there was a time when i i started selling a merch called empower right and i used to sell it through my own website uh, riverchetri.com uh, then right and suddenly what happened was uh, what didn't work then suddenly the technology was available for me to enable that thing uh, and it started working now uh, yeah at that particular time it was just before covid i launched it right and that was in my head uh back in my college if i had that i could have done now i'm selling my merch this technology is available okay now i can do it right and that connect suddenly gave me a new capability right that okay now i can do something in e-commerce so i think a lot of time whenever you are working in an idea it might not work right but it might be a puzzle which you are solving right a lot of time business ventures that i have built were piece of puzzle which i couldn't solve maybe 5 or 10 years back and suddenly like because then sometimes i mean uh, there will be a lot of entrepreneurs maybe who can, who can relate to me uh, who didn't pursue that idea further because there was that problem which you couldn't solve right uh, sometimes there might be technology hurdle uh, there might be different challenges and suddenly imagine after Five years suddenly that solution just comes in front of you, and uh, I think that is how any origin started. And like you know, just a a follow up question to whatever we are speaking just now. Like you know, your journey, like uh, as I just put it in that way, it's from S W E K I M Sikkim to any origins. But between this, like you know, during this time, you've like we've mentioned a couple of times now that you've failed in so many ventures, you know. So nowadays whenever we go online we see look at uh, different people motivational speakers and all everyone is basically teaching you how to build how to become successful but for me like you know uh, for you can say maybe for a selfish reason as well but you know personally i feel what i would like to know is how to fail right even though uh, right now um, what i'm doing is a idea right it's something that even i want to pursue in future in the i'm still in the hustling phase building it up and uh, you know i learned things in in a different way right in in a certain hard ways and all but i would like to know like you know how to fail successfully so that when you fail you exactly know what to do and you know how to come over it because there was a phase in my life as well where my first venture which was you know a, a little heavy on the capital and it didn't work out for various reasons but i got to understand that only later when i looked back at it not at the time when it happened so 
and there was a time where i was very low with my own self and i was still in college back then so uh, kind of like you know low and didn't want to do anything or maybe thought that i couldn't do it again and uh, pretty much learned it little bit in the hard way but what would help me if if you would have to talk to me then back then when i was in that phase what would you have said how would i fail successfully i think uh, the key formula is that fail fast and fail small right uh, that is the best thing that is the best way you can help yourself because at times if it's like you, like if you have spent 10 years and then you think that okay i have failed right like it it's it, like it's a lot of pain and uh, there's a lot of damages uh, that is done on the way right and sometimes uh, it's too big to fail right and i think uh, there's so many examples uh, for me like uh, i started uh, uh, like i made a good good number of investment uh, in sikkim farms i started a um, fresh uh, farm fresh chicken uh basically i was doing home delivery we had around three stores right and and when when i had to shut that down it was so di- like like i mean right now i can't Im- like i can't even imagine how difficult it was right and uh, because it was a big investment and it was during covid okay right to start a venture during covid uh, i spent more than three times of the amount which i i would have started right now right because everything was expensive logistics was expensive manpower expensive everything was expensive then right but uh whenever i feel small or big one thing that i always remember is that uh the 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 amount that uh, you lose right is basically the cost that you are paying for that learning <laughs> right okay it's pretty much uh, the same thing i told myself later yeah, on yeah like i'm not an mba right it's just the course i pay, paid to okay. basically be at iim or <laughs> no, you you might think that i'm making this up but i have friends who are right here behind the camera and you can ask them after the show i have told this thing to them literally i told one of my friend who is sitting right here while i was coming on the way that when i failed in my first venture it was a little you know uh, heavy on expensive and i didn't do my mba but that is my mba <laughs> So yeah. I have literally told the same thing to me but that was only later yeah. like uh, much later but I liked what you said right that fail fast and fail small so I think then that is how we get to learn yeah right so then uh, coming up to like you know um, like uh, coming back again to the business of you know any origins and you know when you're speaking about the KPIs one very important thing that you told was the unit economics right so unit economics basically means like you know the the cost of that one particular product that you know the cost for you to get it to the marketplace right so now uh, how did you think that okay uh, these there are many products which people are not aware right there are so many products okay gundruk may, may be something which everyone knows maybe by different names but it's still there kinema might be kinema might still be there right but you have a lot of sku's right and you have a lot of varieties and eventually you'll have to get uh, customers in customers and traffic in your website right so there's something called customer acquisition right so how do you maintain that like in order to you know suppose if you're selling it to a new crowd how do you you know maintain your customer acquisition cost to be at par so that you don't go like you know your unit economics doesn't go to a very high level where you you know end up taking a hit me yeah, i think it's <laughs> uh it's a very important question like whenever like if you are a consumer brand and if you are selling online uh customer acquisition cost or cac is one of the key uh pointers right uh, see first thing is whenever you are the biggest mistake i have seen uh, a lot of local brands they make is that they don't they, they don't price their product properly Okay. right one of the key factors of unit unit economics is whether you are pricing your product uh properly right for example if you see there are lot of local brands who sell really well locally but they are not available online yeah, yeah right yes uh, and the reason is uh they their pricing is wrong right uh, they have never factored that um, like for example for any origins okay i'll i'll, I'll break it down for you the first cost that we have 
is uh, cost of raw material yes right second is cost of packaging packaging third is cost of production yep yeah. right so that together comes as a product cost yeah right uh, beyond that uh, like uh, for example for food business like if you are if you are just starting and if if you don't have any idea always remember that uh, your cost of product right and uh, your mrp right you should always have 60 to 65% as a gross margin okay right uh, because once you once your product then comes your transportation cost yeah right uh, like if you are, like if you are a big company that comes then comes your distribution cost mm. right a distributor needs a different pricing right he'll keep around uh, maybe 2 to 5% mm. and then the product goes to wholesaler mm. right he keeps another 5% then your go, product goes to retailer retailer in cities look uh, from 25 to 40% okay as a, as their gross yeah, margin yeah as their gross margin and brand local brands don't even keep 20 to 25% as their profit margin okay right so all together if you don't have 60 to 65% gross margin uh, you can't survive. Uh, survive right so so your unit economics is wrong Mm-hmm. right so that is uh, one reason pricing a product properly is very important mm-hmm. right a lot of times we don't factor like for example if you want to sell in amazon like they i think they charge around about 25% right and amazon if you want to scale in amazon you should always provide free shipping mm-hmm. right that comes another 50 to 60 rupees mm-hmm. right so keeping all this in mind if you are not pricing a product properly like today you want to sell a pickle worth 200 minus 60 rupees as sh- shipping price uh, y- y- then your product price is uh, 140 right uh, deduct uh, 25% mm. right uh, like if you deduct uh, 25% out of it i think uh, you are left with uh, that is minus 35 you are left with 105 rupees mm. right Uh, like if you are marketing a bit on amazon like you, even if it's cost per click and uh, your uh, roi um, conversion rate is maybe uh, if 3 or 4x mm. right like for example another 5 rupees is gone right suppose it's 100 rupees now mm. right that means 50% of your cost is gone mm. right and if if and if your product margin is 20 to 25% you're losing a lot of money a there a lot of money yeah right so 50% is just this margin and if your gross margin was 65% you are still making 15% out of it right so a, a layman formula is uh, from cost of production you should always have 65% margin so that like you know all these uh, extra things that margins are required these things are you know covered there yeah exactly right and uh, trust me um, i haven't seen a local brand keep the margin more than 30 40% or 40 45% right because i don't know they are very like a lot of times like for example a lot of dalichilli pickle products uh, sold locally they benchmark their price according to sikkim supreme do you also feel it's because they are shy no like because see okay we i will never i, I think it's a lot to do with uh, uh, a lot to do with maybe uh, like i mean maybe experience like see like for example sikkim supreme sells the sh- cheapest dalli chilli pickle because their cost of production is very low right because they procure in bulk in bulk right like uh, basically i think they have a reserve of 50 metric ton in a year okay right it's huge um, and uh, their procurement cost is very low right compared to a small businesses who are who are working on similar lines of product they are pro- they are buying their produce almost 2 or 3x the price and if they come to the market and if they try to compete with sikkim supreme with price i think uh, it's not possible that's not possible right and a lot of time pricing is done uh, for example how do people price the product is they check the market price and uh, then they try to maybe price very similar lines yeah. or maybe cheaper cheaper that is wrong but then like how or say say okay fine i am someone who wants to sell a dalle chilli pickle now yeah i can't beat sikkim supreme on pricing yeah. because their cost of production is very low right now if i want to beat them uh, now <laughs> how am i supposed to do that like because see if uh, if i don't break the price point 
see quality wise okay but quality only comes after you buy the product and right now even right now people if even locally if i'm competing with sikkim supreme i need to compete with them in those local kirana stores right firstly there now you tell me if i have never seen someone go to a, a store like himalayan fresh right it's a supermarket good super organic supermarket they never go there and bargain they won't right but if they go to kirana stores or if they go to like you know normal stores they will bargain right now if i am to compete with a brand like sikkim supreme which is already established here in the state and their already prices so low and i need to keep the cost of like you know everything in head and then keep my pricing accordingly so how am i supposed to break that see i think uh, for example uh, a person who is going to a kirana store and a person going to a supermarket right it's two different person yeah. right it's two different uh, set of market right and uh, the kind of product that you launch uh, for a kirana store or for a mart it's two different products mm-hmm. right today uh, you can go and maybe uh, purchase a, a, a android phone or a apple phone right it's two different people mm-hmm. right so so i think like it's not that a, a person who is buying an android phone doesn't have money it's just that uh they don't want to spend in a particular category exactly right uh, similarly like a lot of times uh what we tend to do is we like suppose if if i want to compete to uh to a brand uh, who already has a great market uh, locally right i would always uh pick or uh, maybe i'll do a research and innovate on my product Okay. like like for example if uh, if a brand has a particular range of product maybe i'll launch a range of product that a brand doesn't have but still a consumer can uh, relate to it right for example today sikkim supreme has a range of dalit chili pickle right but uh, suppose for example today a local market has that appetite of uh, uh trying out spicy food right uh, which like which normally in in uh, northeast uh, like it's very prominent right like i mean to think of a innovative product like uh maybe like i haven't seen a brand sell a dalit chili crisp uh in sikkim yeah right or they're selling ice creams though yeah dalit chili ice cream <laughs> Uh, ice creams are there but dalit chili crisp is a uh, uh, like like it's a very similar line of product mm-hmm. right but 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 i haven't seen a brand do that uh, i haven't seen uh, a very premium brand uh, uh, like with sell chili oil mm-hmm. right and uh, like like if you see youngsters today uh, they are more attracted to uh, this kind of product yeah right which uh which they see uh maybe their aspiration or the ideal co- consuming uh, across the world and uh, they want a very similar type of product and so it basically is a lifestyle mm-hmm. right today uh, like we don't uh like if you see sikkim supreme right now has innovated a lot mm-hmm. right and now they are uh, selling dalit chili in olive oil right yeah, yeah, yes i've seen that so 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 that's for a premium customer mm-hmm. right uh, they have recently launched a passion fruit uh, uh, yeah. jam yes right they had uh, other jams but passion fruit they had squash but they were not in that category of jams right so they are also constantly innovating in terms of product i think for a food business you you should always uh, keep innovating keep trying out new product at the same time uh, try to improve the current product that you have right so so i think to compete with a brand like sikkim supreme uh, innovation and constant innovation is something that is required mm-hmm. at the same time looking at markets where they are not looking at mm-hmm. right so these are i think uh, key ways how uh, one can see and try to compete in a local market or uh, try to like how they can establish themselves be the local market this thing so like you know uh, i think coming down to the say final quarter of a conversation and you know getting down to one very important point like i just spoke about you know we just talked about how we can you know try to at least beat someone who's already established in the local market say in 
the high society market like you know the bigger market like where you are dwelling in right now how important is funding for you like you've mentioned it quite a number of times that you know people from the northeast if they are making a certain ecosystem or if they are coming up with startups and even though there are good ideas and i know there are a lot of entrepreneurs the whole reason for me uh, you know starting this podcast is because what i consume podcast a lot i watch a lot of podcasts right uh, even running in the country today and i saw that you know northeast uh, as a whole like you know maybe entrepreneurs pilots uh, the army professions and people from all these different professions they haven't been featured enough right so that is something which even i thought that would be interesting to do and that's the reason why i started this so again coming back to my question how important is funding for you and why do you feel it's you know a little difficult for the startups from the northeast to get that funding i know you have secured one so yeah. how yeah. how difficult was it for you i think funding is a different territory which northeastern entrepreneurs have not uh, tried into right uh one thing is that uh the funding structure uh where like you shared out the equity to a uh, external investor i like i i have seen lot of entrepreneurs from northeast who are not comfortable to do that mm. right like a uh, lot of good entrepreneurs they believe in that okay i'll run run it small but i, I need to own it completely mm. right they, there's that value system that they have <laughs> but people who are open to funding i think uh, for us when we raised our first round um i think one thing is that we ourselves need to be very confident right uh, because somebody else is putting their money means till time you are not confident how can they be confident on you right and uh, to raise money uh, a lot of time uh, investors uh, don't care about the idea but they invest in the founder initial like i think in the initial uh, first maybe few rounds it's completely founder and their team right so a lot of time what i've seen is like for me i've always been a solo founder mm. right uh, and uh, for any origins i have a partner mm. right and uh, i think it really helps you when you have a partner uh, like if you want to raise money but funding like if you see in terms of northeast uh, right now we have a very regional specific funding uh, called northeast venture fund and uh, northeast venture fund uh, they invest in northeastern startups so that has opened lot of doors for uh, start- startups from northeast but if you see uh, started from northeast raising money from external vc fund or any venture fund right it has always been a challenge uh, i think it's a locational strategic challenge right because a lot of time vcs are comfortable to invest in startups which are in cities or closer to cities where they can uh, oversee or where they can manage teams or or uh, a lot of times they want to be in touch with the business right and uh, that is one disadvantage we have as a region do you think that uh, in near future it might happen and you know people should really start looking at the northeast because i still feel like investing wise there hasn't been much investment here in the northeast i think you are one of the few is back that investment um i think uh, it's time for uh, hnis to start looking at different startups mm-hmm. right uh, because northeast like if you see per capita income uh, if you see the kind of money northeastern people have it's 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 surplus right like i mean uh, sikkim is i think like in terms of uh, gdp like we are a very small state but we have a uh we have a impressive G- gdp if you see other states in northeast there are so many hnis yeah, yeah. right like uh you can see it with the number of private banks right and uh, and if you see the kind of savings deposit uh people have in sikkim right uh if you talk with like like and and all these figures are very much public right you can just go to rbi and see the kind of savings to uh loan ratio of sikkim right like we are not taking enough money right so a lot of money is staying idle i think this is the time when uh, they should look into uh, investing in different startups and i think startups should also buckle up and uh, maybe uh, try to pitch and uh, so that interest right because 
uh to raise my first round i, I think i have pitched to pitch more than 50 times uh, to multiple people right so it takes a lot of time i have traveled across the country i've go, i've been to delhi <laughs> right and uh, heard a no from an investor i have been to bombay and uh, yeah so were you think, very clear that you wanted to get an investment from outside rather than you know the usual go to method of friends to family um so i mean see for example the first thing if an entrepreneur wants to raise money is structuring the company accordingly right you can have you can't have a proprietorship and uh, think of raising money right you need to be a private, private limited, limited has to right be, yeah. secondly till the time you don't have a great team mm. uh, like it's very difficult for investors to uh, basically come in because uh, they look for a team uh, whenever they want to invest money right thirdly they also see uh, founders track record and how comfortable they are with the founder and uh, because at that particular point of time they are investing on a founder more than the idea, the idea right what? because idea like, like for example when we raise money we were a marketplace right and right now we are a brand yeah. right and tomorrow i don't know how and what uh, shape will the brand take but i'm just talking about uh, uh, like if an investor is confident in me, uh, they'll have to trust me, right? So to build that trust, a founder needs to be very focused or uh, they need to have that convincing power, right? Like, I mean, uh, convincing cannot just be in talks, but convincing needs to happen in actions, right? Mm -hmm. uh, a founder needs to uh, believe in him, himself or herself, right? So that the investor, whoever wants to come in, can believe in him or her, right? So... It's uh, it's not very easy, but it's not very difficult, right? How much of the control does this, you know, uh, the VCs who ever invest, how like how much of control do they have on the company? Uh, I mean, depending uh, on like the in initial rounds, yeah. right? Uh, or like you should always choose an investor who are not not very controlling. Uh, maybe in later rounds, uh, a controlling investor might help you a lot. But initially, uh, I really feel that idea should shape up according to the founder and not the investor right so you should always choose a investor who is not very controlling initially so uh i think with this like you know um it was like you know i learned so much just you know talking to you today and you know right before thing we finish this up and like you know summarize it so basically uh if uh, in uh, before we wrap up this entrepreneurial you know this uh, journey like i if i may put it so how would you like you know uh, categorize the journey of an entrepreneur like you know um, if someone wants to be an entrepreneur today and is uh, you know viewing this uh, podcast what would you advise that person like how to you know uh, be prepared for his journey what should he expect and what he shouldn't expect um uh... Like I, like whenever I have to uh, give a deep answer, I I, I tend to close my eyes. <laughs> um, so when I was in my college, right, uh, why I started was I wanted to be free, right. I loved freedom, right, and to be free, I wanted to be independent, right, and it was all about I, me, myself, right, and to be, I think to be an entrepreneur, you should first think about yourself. Right. A lot of time you always think about others. Right. And uh, that is all, like those are the times you drain yourself out because you can't make everyone happy. Right. And uh, that was the first thing uh, which I learned about myself uh, when I started. I loved freedom. That is why I chose to do what I was doing. I started very small. I think uh, a lot of time in publicly I have spoken about it. I started with a printer. Uh, which I bought in 3000. I still remember it was Canon. Uh, Canon Pixma. Like, no. I, I Canon, it was a color print and I used to use cartridges. Okay. okay. And uh, then I realized uh, if I keep buying cartridges, uh, I'll be in loss. Okay. Right? Because the cartridge cost was very high. Right. So then I started looking for how I can make money out of it. So I started refilling the cartridge with ink and injection. 
right uh, and i still and i saw multiple tutorials and and i learned the way how i could uh, refill my ink and a lot of times uh, my hand used to be black and different colors when i used to go for my classes right okay now i understood that basic okay now i can print and make money okay. right because uh, buying cartridges and printing i was not able to make money because it was costly once i knew i could print and make money then i started learning that uh, in the beginning of semester people needed timetables right so i started printing timetables and i used to sell that right like for example first year second year different uh, different streams uh, once i had that uh, then i realized uh, people uh, need projects at the end of the semester right then i used to sell stick file according with print right and then uh, that is how i learned that okay people needs notes and like so basically adapting with the market okay. and uh, even when i had a printer i named it i named oh, okay. it rz prints okay. right and uh, just outside my mess i used to have a poster printing available block d room number 26 right and uh, contact number and uh, yeah so that was how, that that was how, that was my first venture right and i did that uh, my in my entire college year okay. i first bought a cycle for myself and then i bought a scooty right and then uh, maybe second year third year uh, like whenever there used to be a college fest uh, i opened a food stall uh, just outside uh the fest right when everyone was enjoying i was enjoying my in my own way right um i was selling momo and uh, phale and uh, all all of the local food mm-hmm. right using uh like different friends from my student union from sikkim right and uh i think i got around 10 cartoons of sikkim supreme squash uh that's how i relate to it and i sold it Uh, mixing with water and called it mocktail <laughs> right and uh, and i and i and i think i sold it for 50 rupees per glass and and it used to be a small glass right and uh, those were the initial days and i still remember the name of the stall uh, peking stall right so 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 it's very vivid yeah i know everything that i have done right and i know how i made my initial bucks mm-hmm. uh, and then Uh, one point i went to travel to this place called like i wanted to travel till tawang but i didn't have enough money so i went till bomdila which is halfway to tawang okay right i landed up to this in to this town uh, i started looking for hotels online i couldn't find any suddenly i walked uh, like i think it was dark i walked into a direction i went i saw a hotel which was really good but not available online right so i went to the owner like i don't know what i was thinking then i went to the owner i told him that okay i'll build a website for you i'll bring in business for you you just give me 30% off uh, whatever i bring it to you and owner because he wasn't getting anything he said yes okay right that same year uh, i owned 3 lakhs from that hotel okay. right because i built a website i put them online on make my trip i think all of the otas right and uh, while i was doing that i made money and i was in my college right and i still get calls because i have i haven't changed my number i still get calls for that same hotel <laughs> and they say that oh the, he, is this this hotel and i say that no it's wrong number mm-hmm. right but i still get calls uh, because of that hotel and when i was managing that hotel uh, what happened was a lot of people called me as a hotel they booked rooms and they wanted taxis right and there were so many people wanted taxis so i thought okay why not start a taxi company because the hotel is not mine i think the taxi company will stay with me forever right and once i started uh, any taxi right uh, then what i did was i started looking for uh, drivers right or travel agencies so what i did was i started looking at prominent travel agencies across northeast right i see i used to get bookings and i used to give it to them and what this prominent travel agencies did was they didn't pay my share to me okay. because the tourists used to directly pay to the travel agency mm-hmm. and they didn't pay my share 
so i was frustrated and then it clicked my mind that okay uh i i have uh, students from across northeast in my college why don't i call them and ask them if they know drivers so i call i call one of my junior from shillong because shillong was the first location i started and when i where i was getting lot of bookings uh, there was this junior called i think his, his name was chiranjit chinmay chinmay bhattacharya okay. right i called him to my room and i told him uh chinmay do you know reliable drivers and he said that i don't know but my uh, dad might know right his dad was working in nehu uh north is yeah, he university yeah, and uh, yeah and he called his father and uh, his father gave me my first good lead his name was mukesh okay right and uh, i started working with him right and slowly what i realized was i have network from across northeast in my college then i started getting people from across northeast uh drivers who were reliable because uh pe- because my college was an engineering college right a lot of the students had uh, maybe if not them their parents would have a reliable person right and and what i knew was if mukesh does anything wrong i can always call uh, call my junior and ask him to call his dad right so there was always that feedback mechanism right so that is how i started and uh, mukesh from that uh, i think when he was driving for me he was a driver and right now he has four taxis he himself has four yeah. taxis so the journey was very beautiful right and uh, it start like everything starts very small right and uh, not from day one uh, like you start seeing the bigger picture like i always have had a dream right it's not that uh, i was uh, like i mean like it's not that i was like i started one thing and then it slowly evolved into something but from day one i i always wanted to make it big right and i think every entrepreneur will will relate to it like i might uh from outside i might want to be as humble as possible from but from within uh what excites me is uh making that jump right doing things that uh, nobody dares to do right and uh, going out there every day right risking everything making that big bets right hoping that uh, it will happen right and slowly inch by inch i move forward right day by day i i try to push the limits right and slowly hoping that one day uh, that limit Uh, re- makes me reach or uh, reaches where i want to be so i think that's how an entrepreneur's journey is right and uh, everything s- starts small right i can still remember the days where when i used to print right and i can st- and i still cherish those moments uh, representing my state country at, a, at an international forum right and i i'm still grateful of my team uh these are the facts that will never change uh because i i have a clear philosophy right uh i am 1% done 99% is still left to go right i think the day i feel that i'm 10% done i think i think uh, i'll be too uh too proud of doing or working hard so uh, these are a few of my philosophies of my life so far that was a very scenic and a very you know beautiful picture that you just painted and i think on that very special note i think it's a very beautiful note to end thank you so much rivasda for giving us this time and you know i myself uh, i've looked up to you for a very long time and uh, i've learned a lot from you like this is the first time we are sitting and having this long a conversation but even before that i followed your journey from uh, any taxi to be very honest and i really you know uh, like locally you were one of my inspirations right because i uh, like you you were the closest with whom i could connect so uh, yeah uh, thank you so much and uh, yeah, thank you so much for doing this and i hope that you su- have success more success and even in the field of politics that now you've just joined and wish you all the best great health and a happy new year thank you so thank much you. thank you